We are now live, Diana, you can start. Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I will start, I will wait for a minute in order to allow everyone to connect. So, okay. Um, So, okay, it's the last session in the afternoon, so we wait. Okay, so um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Diana Zavala Rojas. Um, I'm the chair of this session. I will introduce me and my colleagues in a, in a second. Uh, this session is called Innovations in Data Production as it corresponds to the chapter of shock um, where we explore how to um, enhance data production for the social sciences, humanities and um, heritage um, sciences. So, um, oops, my slide, uh, yeah. So some housekeeping rules. Um, the sessions will be recorded and made available afterwards. So by staying in the session, you um, give your consent to be recorded. Please stay muted and keep your video off uh, during presentations. And um, you can ask questions in the chat throughout the session and questions will be answered after each presentation as they are quite different from each other. So uh, we have three presentations today. Uh, this correspond to the first outputs of um, the shock chapter on innovations in data production. First, I will introduce the multilingual corpus of Surrey questionnaires. And as I said, my name is Diana. I'm part of the core scientific team of the ESS ERIC. And I am based at Universitat Pompeu Fabra in Barcelona. Next, we will have Yuri Petinici from uh, SHARE uh, ERIC. This is the survey of health and aging and retirement in Europe. And he's based at the Max Planck Institute for Social Law and Social Policy in Munich. Finally, we will have the IOLI platform by Roxanne Roussel. And uh, she is based at the French National Center for Scientific Research. So with this introduction, I will uh, stop sharing and share again to change my slides. Um, Wait a second. Okay. Um, I'll start presenting the multilingual corpus of survey questions. Okay. So, um, corpus is a quite specific uh, word, technical word in, in linguistics and, and language research. So, I will first introduce to you all what is a corpus, then, why um, give a background of why. Uh, we plan in the shock and need uh, a multilingual corpus of survey questionnaires. Some examples um, on this tool, uh, the design of it behind the scenes, how to access it, and then I will open the session for questions and answers I get in the chat. Okay, so what is a text corpus? Um, in linguistics, a corpus, it's plural corpora, is a large and structured set of texts texts set as data. Texts are stored in machine readable format and you may wonder what is machine readable format. So are PDFs machine readable? No, they are not. Are MS Word documents machine readable? No, they are not. Because the internal 
um, the structure and the formatting and other characteristics of these documents are not internally stored in a machine. So for instance, if we have a PDF, um, the machine doesn't know to, to realize how to realize if it has a table or if it has what is the content of pictures. Um, in corpus linguistics, um, the use of corpus or the use of text data is uh, implemented to conduct statistical analysis and hypothesis testing on language domains, checking occurrences or validating linguistic rules. Big data language applications, such as you may know Google Translate or Microsoft Translate, use corpus data, uh, huge amounts of corpus data. A parallel corpus, such as the one that I'm presenting today, is a collection of aligned texts. And usually alignments become a source text and its translations occur at the sentence level. So you have one sentence in English, for instance, and its translation into French align uh, at each sentence. Some famous corpus that are available, um, the Digital Corpus of the European Parliament, commissioned by the European Commission, um, contains the documents uh, made by the European Parliament in 23 languages. Then the Europarl corpus consists of the proceedings of the European Parliament. So the first one is a more general corpus uh, consisting of all the documents uh, produced by the Commission. And the second is the proceedings specifically. The Oxford English Corpus, the largest one of its kind, uh, with about 2.1 billion words, and the open subtitles that are automatic uh, translated movie and TV subtitles. You may be familiar with this one if you at some point turn on your captions uh, function in YouTube, for instance. These uh, subtitles are automatically generated and this constitutes a corpus. Okay, why do we need a corpus of sorry questionnaires? So ESS share um, um, EVS, so these are major survey projects in Europe, their data archives provide similar information to end users. Primary data, that is the survey data in CSV or similar forms, formats such as SPSS, data, etc., and documentation including questionnaires in PDF form. So this means that it's quite easy to access the primary data, but access and use of questions texts for research purposes systematically and in a comparative way is still underdeveloped. For instance, you may just want the um, texts to compare source items of EVS, for instance, across round using the term democracy. So you would have to go to all these PDFs and look for the words and um, kind of do an analysis of it. To compare translations in French of the same question across languages or survey projects, but simply to get the questions, texts, and copy them in the appendix of an article to be submitted to a journal, this would be quite challenging. And I will show you in a second why um, that is the case. To get questions in a format that allows programming of survey technologies that require survey questions, text in multiple languages, Qualtrics, electronic questionnaire devices, um, etc to implement technologies that require text of different survey projects. So for instance, if a European panel takes place, we would need the text of all these survey infrastructures in a, a machine uh, readable format as text data. To implement computational resources such as machine translation, predictions of questions complexity, or um, the verification tool that uh, Yuri will tell us um, about in a second. To trace back breaks in the time series due to wording change, this example can be uh, ESS specific. If a national team decides to undergo a um, revision of, of translation uh, in certain questions because they consider that appropriate, so data on these texts allows to do this um, easier among other uses you may have for the texts themselves. So accessing and comparing questionnaires texts manually can be quite challenging in these survey projects. For instance, I'm showing you here the three uh, versions. So these are uh, screenshots of the PDFs uh, from the ESS in round eight. It's the same question which that we uh, call by B1 and three versions of French in Belgium, in France, and in Switzerland. You already see that it's 
that you have to go through it, detect which are the same elements, um, then compare the texts. Um, these you would have to have the PDFs at hand. Then we have here an example for, from Share Wave 7. I guess this is a bit even more difficult because Share has their questionnaires in a highly uh, technical format. So you first have to make sense of the questions and then use them for, for instance, copying them in an appendix for a paper or try to compare the translations. The EVS looks more promising in recent rounds. You can see here that they have sort of say standardized their formats, but this was not the case in early rounds. This is how you would compare early rounds of the EVS uh, from the early 80s. So basically it's all scan images of these questionnaires when there were not even computers. You can see here that this is um, uh, type with another technology. So in summary, end users have easy access to primary data, that is the survey data, but usability of the documentation, including questionnaires, is not well developed yet. So the solution we have in shock is to develop a database of survey questionnaires. It provides machine readable data that has valuable metadata associated with it, which is not present in PDF questionnaires, to identify clearly the questions, their linguistic components, and the survey projects. So you may wonder if a corpus is the same as a question bank. So a corpus can be considered a question bank because it is a collection of questions and metadata. But a question bank cannot be considered a corpus because it is not necessarily designed as linguistic data. And here in the design, we were careful to follow um, European standards on, on, on linguistic data, that is Clarine standards. So this is how the standards of these two uh, banks can be quite different. So I now will go to uh, show you some examples of the MCSQ from the prototype phase interface. Uh, we aim to develop this interface to beta version during the shock. Now it's a prototype and you can access it here in this website. So for instance, what about comparing the agree items in French and France in Belgium in the ESS round six? So you will put the equivalent of agree, accord, in uh, compare by word. So I'm here in the compare versions area. And then select the study, select the year, and select the um, language country combinations you want to, to show in the same um, table. And then you will find uh, something like this. It's quite difficult to see now uh, because the, the web page is not yet optimized for all screens, but let's say that we zoom into it and uh, we will have these eight columns, so to say. So firstly, we have uh, an easy way to identify this survey item. It is from the ESS in round six that was commissioned in 2012 in French, in Belgium. Uh, the identifier from the questionnaire is D16. This corresponds to the request, so to the question, it's not a response scale. And you will have the same information for the other segment. So you could really compare, um, so to say, piece by piece, segment by segment, uh, sentence by se sentence, both questionnaires uh, in French from both countries. Then uh, another sort of exercise could be to compare EVS response scales from 20, uh, 2008 in German and Germany and Switzerland and include the French Swiss version. For instance, if you want to check whether the French Swiss version is closer to German uh, Swiss version rather than these uh, German versions together, you can conduct this type of linguistic analysis. Then you will have a similar table um, but this time it will have more information, of course. So this will be the German version from Germany. The, version, the second uh, set will be the German version from Switzerland. And the third one, the French version from Switzerland. Another example, let's see that you want to check uh, all questions in the database that have the word income on it. So you select the English source, for instance, the ESS, and then you will have a collection of 
um, questions that has used the uh, term income in the ESS. Finally, let's see, let's check that you want to map how agree has been translated in Russian across countries. So you have to type agree and then select uh, Russian here for Estonia, filter by study and get uh, this aligned table of the English segments, then the Russian segments for Estonia, and then the source text and the translations on it. So um, behind the scenes, the MCSQ is a large and structured collection of questionnaires texts implemented as an entity relation database in SQL. I will show you the diagram in a second. It is an open access and open source research resource um, in line with the fair data principles. We know that there are several um, uh, collections of texts uh, uh, available, so to say, but they may be proprietary. So this is open access and open source. You can get all the scripts to replicate the database. And of course you can access uh, freely the database. So version Beatrice Worsley, uh, we name each version after a female scientist. So I recommend you look for this one which is our uh, version 1.1, has 169 distinct questionnaires so far from the ESS, EDS, and shared COVID questionnaires. The largest coverage so far is for the ESS, but this will change in the near future, and we will have EDS and shared um, covered as well. The data is now from nine languages, English source and its translations into Catalan, Czech, French, German, Norwegian, Portuguese, Spanish, and Russian. More than 20 countries we have. Um, I would say it's more than 30 now. The largest subset is for Russian um, because in the EVS early rounds, we have uh, several countries uh, that uh, no one else has in the later future, like Azerbaijan, Belarus, um, Moldova, etc. So far, we have more than 400,000 segments, that is sentences and shorter linguistic units. And the nomenclature of the data provides information to identify the survey items directly. As you saw, we use uh, an abbreviation of the survey project. It is SHA for share, EVS or ESS. Then we use the round or the wave, the year it is officially uh, published, then three ISO digits for the language and two ISO digits for the country. So behind the scenes, uh, the database is quite simple. We have in this first purple table, the metadata that connects with the uh, main table of the survey items and the module, the module corresponds to the questionnaire. We divided um, here the survey item into four basic components uh, following the literature in survey research, introduction, instruction, request, and response. And then with this, we were able to construct the table alignment, which has the source texts and its translations. So this uh, basic, uh, the composition of the survey items into four components only, uh, despite that the survey projects have different uh, classifications of, of their questionnaires, allows to develop a tailored alignment method and to design a database that is scalable in, in which new data is added easily. Um, so to access it, we have a dedicated website. Uh, this um, database is stored in a, a virtual machine at UPF. You can access the dedicated website here at uh, upf.edu uh, slash web slash MCSQ. And then you have two ways to access it. For those of you that want to try out the SQL um, platform and language, and those of you who know about it, you can go to directly to a Postgre uh, platform. You just have to write us to get us access keys. For those of you who want to try out the interface, uh, you go to the same sort of address, but prefixed by easy. And then you can uh, sign up and sign in uh, to access the database. And you will see um, the same sort of examples I show here. Um, it's, it's fully functional now. 
but in order to don't uh, complicate the bandwidth uh, issues by the Zoom, I, I just um, decided to show you some screenshots, but it's fully, um, it's, it's operational now. So uh, during this last year of the shock project, so 2021, we are aim, aim, aiming to consolidate this tool by adding more data, especially from share and EVAs, Refine queries to the user's interface. So if you're using it and find something that is not working or would like us to receive feedback, please write us. Add some functionalities that are currently being developed, such as customized downloadable data. Now you have to ask us for the data um, and we can generate that subset. But the idea is that uh, users themselves can download the survey uh, texts. Add linguistic annotations to the data. Uh, that would um, allow us to comply with Clarin uh, standards for preserving this database permanently in one of their repositories. Test the corpus in the context of translation procedures as a translation memory. This is also happening during the shock um, in some other task. And dissemination and publishing. We're starting to present this project in um, specific conferences and events like this. And our uh, paper is on the review in the Meta Journal de Traductors, um, where we try to showcase how to use corpus linguistics to um, refine the theoretical trap model. This is a translation review adjudication protesting and documentation model from Hartness in 2003. That is the um, gold standard for translations uh, for translation in survey research. So we aim to refine a little bit this method with the use of corpus linguistics. So um, just finishing my slides. In conclusion, access to primary data is well developed across survey research infrastructures. Access to secondary data, including questionnaires, still underdeveloped. The MCSQ, uh, the multilingual corpus of survey questionnaires, aim to contribute to users' experience by making questions easily available. It will support programming of survey tools by providing the texts in machine readable format. And it provides a platform to improve translation procedures, documentation and research by allowing search and comparison of questions texts across languages within languages and across survey projects. Finally, it promotes linguistic analysis of questionnaires, for instance, comparison of them, search for collocations, neighboring terms, and um, by storing these texts as data. So we invite you to explore it in this uh, website. And I think that's all from my side. So I will stop sharing and uh, see if I can collect any questions in the chat so far. Um, please, if you want to come in with questions, just... Um, type of raise your hand. If there are no questions, let me check. I think we don't have questions. So I will now ask Judy um, to go next. And maybe we can have some time for more questions if there are any at the end of the session. Um, Yuri, make sure you're unmuted before you start. Let me check if I can. Yeah, now you're unmuted. I can hear you. Let's see if I'm able to go to full screen. Mm. Should be this one. Okay. Yeah, excellent. So thank you for um, uh, from Yuri Petiniki, uh, thank you for this opportunity uh, to present uh, this joint work with the uh, Chen and, um, and Alexander Fraser from um, LMU. So today the talk is about uh, improving uh, translation, uh, shared translation verification. So our aim here in this project is to provide an extra tool to the translators 
if we want to improve their working environment, when they translate uh, um, questionnaire items from SHARE, and um, as, we, as we heard recently, so SHARE stands for Survey of Health, Aging and Retirement in Europe. So I was saying, when would they translate the questionnaire items from the, from the questionnaire, we want to uh, improve uh, the translation environment. So what we do more specifically, so the, the tool we have in mind, they should help uh, them during the verification of the translation. It's just one of many tools that we use at SHARE for quality control and for the management of translation procedure. So why do we need this extra tool? Well, uh, the overarching goal is to avoid an avoidable mistake. And that's quite challenging when we face high volume of work under time pressure and the dealing with complexity. So the idea here is to empower a translator with machine translation tool and exploit the competitive advantages the humans and machine have. So we ask humans uh, uh, to focus on what they do best and we let the machine to take care of these uh, repetitive tasks. So let me just give you a little bit of background. Uh, we were setting up the tool and testing uh, in-house this tool, uh, the performance of the tool, when it came very useful for the verification and translation of the shared Corona questionnaire. So um, we had uh, 242 items in this questionnaire and they were mainly um, made by questions, instruction, and response option. So overall, we end up to have more than, than 11,000 uh, words to translate. And um, uh, the tool was uh, ready only for one language. That was uh, a pity back then, that language was is German. And um, so we had to translate the questionnaire in, uh, in German for four different countries. So. Germany, of course, Austria, Luxembourg, and Switzerland. Um, the checking is, um, so at, at the end of the day, the, the data set we, 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 we use the tool for is made by 968 um, uh, items. Okay? So the, the, the size of the sample, the size of the data set we, uh, I will discuss later. So the checking is made uh, um, using the bilingual word embeddings. And uh, I will give you more about this in, in a minute. And um, the output of the checking uh, at the end is a translation score that is provided by the machine that uh, allow us to flag the, out, the item, so the text, uh, because they, so when the, the, um, the, the translation score is below the given threshold, we flag it and, uh, and we ask for rechecking. So here I show you a, a small diagram of the exercise. So we start with the, the source text in English. Then the human translator generate the target text to so the translation. And both text, the source text and the target text, is this, uh, both of, the, of these uh, fields are sent to, the, to, the, to our um, tool. So this, uh, the, uh, where we make use of these bilingual uh, word embeddings. And uh, if uh, the, the item is flagged, so there is something that is going on here, we ask the, um, we ask the, the translator to double check again. So before to have a look at the result of this exercise, we perform this, this year. Um, so let's have a look at the tool that we, we, we implemented. So we train unsupervised bilingual word embeddings. And we were doing so using monolingual corpora, not bilingual corpora, but monolingual corpora. So the corpus we use uh, is made of general text uh, we, we heard before Europar, but also we combine this, uh, general this general corpus with the domain specific text. And here I talk about a set of questions that were coming from uh, other services in Europe, like uh, ESS and, uh, and SHARE. And uh, at the end, uh, basically, so this, uh, um, what, we, what, we, what we do here with, with, in, uh, with this bilingual word embeddings, so each word is mapped to a vector of real numbers. And then we check the closeness of the word that is translated with the word that is in the source text. 
given the, the position along these vectors. So in other words, uh, in other words, uh, so using the train uh, uh, German uh, English embeddings, uh, so the tool performs a bilingual lexical induction. That's the, the, the mechanism we use to check this closeness. And, uh, and at the end, we match the translated word with the word in the source text. For each item, as I said before, uh, the tool computer translation score that is given by the ratio between the number of the matched words here, how many words in the, in, in the text has been matched, over the number uh, of the words that are available in the human translation. As I mentioned before, when the translation score is below a given threshold, we decide to flag the item. So, Let's have a briefly look at the results here and um, um, wh what we can see here is like uh, the distribution of all the translation scores for all the items we have in our data set, as I said before, 968 items. And um, um, on average, we can, uh, so the threshold is set to 0 0.45 is a, a, is a ad hoc uh, um, threshold. And for all the items that are below this threshold, um, we, uh, they, they receive a flag from, uh, our, uh, uh, from us. So on average, we can see that uh, the translation score, so the value provided by the, by the, the, by the tool, is uh, around 60%. So that means that 60% of the words that are translated are also matched in the source text given our, in, uh, given the, the, our procedure. And the 60% is uh, quite close to what we observed before in uh, in-house when we were trying to test the performance of the tool uh, using testing data sets. Um, once we apply this uh, 0 0.45 threshold, uh, we, in the, we, we end up to flag 255 items uh, that are around uh, a fourth of the items uh, in the data set. And then uh, when we send these uh, 255 items back to the, to the translators, the, the, the country teams in, the, in, in our case, um, we ask them to, to, to check if there is a, a, any change to be made in the item flag. And the, the, the translator uh, provide us a feedback here and they say, okay, the, the item needs to be changed, they, they need to be improved the translation or not. And according to their response, we can say that over the 255 items we have in our, in our data set that are flagged, 69, were the, 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 for 69 of them, uh, there was uh, some change was necessary. Uh, and um, uh, we call them the actual positives, the true positives. The system was able to, to, to spot something to be changed. So we call them the true positive. And, uh, and, uh, 27% was the, uh, the final uh, um, uh, true positive rate. While on the other end, we have uh, 186 uh, items that uh, were flagged, but uh, for, for which uh, the translator decided not to do any change. So they, they, they decide to, to keep the translation as it is in the first version. And uh, that uh, ended up to be, uh, to be like a 72, 73% of false positive rate. So our, our um, tool was able to spot um, a, a, an item that indeed was not uh, to be spotted out. Um, to, to, to have a look uh, uh, in more detail about uh, which item, uh, so where the, our, uh, uh, for which item our uh, instrument work well or not, let's have a look at the country team to see if we have anything there that uh, can explain this. We have that um, uh, um, for uh, uh, the translation score, the average of the translation score, is, more, is, a bit, is a between 0 0.5 and 0 0.6 for all the countries. And is lower for Luxembourg. So on average, the translation score uh, uh, provided by the, uh, when we apply the, machine, the, the tool to the, to, the, to the item translated by the Luxembourg team, we have a, a lower translation score on average. That uh, imply a higher, higher number of uh, items to be flagged that indeed end up to be uh, 
true positive cases. On the other end, for other countries like Austria and Germany, the number of items is lower, that they have been flagged around 60. And uh, none of them, uh, they, th there was uh, any follow up uh, uh, from the side of the translator. So the, the false positive rate here is very high. So that's the first uh, result we can see. So it depends on the quality of the, of the country team. And uh, we, 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 can, uh, we can see that our system is able to spot uh, uh, better some, uh, uh, some, uh, something to be checked. Um, other, other characteristics according to which we want to, other dimensions that we want to have a look here is uh, the, the, um, the type of uh, the item. So when we, we differentiate according to the, the type of the item, that is question text, uh, uh, instruction for interviewers and response options. And uh, we can see here that uh, the, the average of the translation score is, uh, is lower for the um, interviewer instruction that uh, indeed uh, end up to be a, a, a higher um, a fraction of items that are, have been flagged, so almost uh, half of them. Nevertheless, only 30% of these items, uh, they turn out to be true positive cases, around the same uh, line of the, of the question text. On the other end, we have uh, that uh, for the response option, and when we, we have very, uh, um, very short sentences, the, um, the, the, the fraction of items that have been flagged is, um, is on average 35%. And uh, so among the, all the items that have been flagged, uh, there is a high uh, false positive rate, uh, or almost 80%, um, that, uh, that was the turnout to be. And then that's lead us to the third uh, um, categorization of the, our results, because the response option tends to be a short text. So we split our data, our data set uh, of items uh, according to the length uh, of uh, each item uh, and we count the words. So between uh, one, on, one and three words, between four and 10 words and uh, between 11 and 20 or more than 20 words per item. And again, we can look at, have a look at the, um, at the average of the translation score is a, uh, um, is lower for uh, the items that, uh, that have between four and 10 words. That turned out to be a higher frequency of a high fr fraction of uh, if item to be flagged here. And nevertheless, we have uh, the, the, um, the, the same uh, um, positive, true positive rate uh, uh, with respect to the, the, the group of with, between with one and three words. So it turns out that uh, uh, even if, so when, when we have a short sentences, um, the, the, the probability to, to be flagged is, uh, um, is uh, higher but the, the, the true positive rate is still, uh, is still lower. Uh, on, on the other end, uh, that's more uh, closer to what we expected is like uh, when we have uh, long sentences, so more than 20 words per, per item, we, we observe that uh, the, the frequency of, uh, of uh, items that have been flagged is uh, low, it's 17%, but nevertheless among those uh, uh, 27 items, uh, almost half of, of them, they, they end up to be true positive. And so these items, they require, to, to, they require some changes in the translation. That we have so far, let me briefly uh, drive some, uh, um, so derive some uh, uh, preliminary lesson uh, from, um, from the, this exercise. So it, it, what, we, what we observe uh, during the, this exercise that we, it was an efficient process. So it was easy to extract uh, all the, the, the first version of translation, uh, that, uh, checking them and send back to the translator. They, they were able to um, go through only the flagged items. It didn't take too much time. And it didn't take too much uh, effort from, uh, from their end. And uh, uh, at least for the true positive cases, uh, we improve the translation. So we can say we have a, a, a better uh, um, final, final translation. Nevertheless, we observe that at this stage with the, the, the current version of the tool, we still have a, a high false positive rate. And it's higher when the, the translation, uh, the initial translation of the, of the, the quality of the, of the, the translation is uh, is very high, so very good team, or uh, the, is not the second language for the country team, uh, like in the case of Luxembourg. 
is, the, is higher the false positive rate for the response options, so and for the short sentences. So that could be also due to the fact that if you don't have that word match in the in the in the, in the, in the system, the the translation score is it's easily going to towards zero. And uh, that can also be uh, one possible explanation. We found out that like uh, uh, this, this, this software was able to, the, to, to tell us uh, after the, 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 the checking, uh, which unmatched word they, they, they've been finding. So uh, we were able to, 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 have a, to create a list of words that were not available in the training data. So giving a brief example. So we were using training data where coronavirus was not, uh, was not uh, Present, so because we, we we didn't use that word uh, in last year, but only only this year. Uh, so one way to improve it here is like we are gonna include this unmatched word in the training data. We're gonna expand the, the domain specific uh, data set, and that uh, would have we expect the much better um, uh, performance of the of the model. So then, therefore, we're gonna retrain the by the 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 bilingual word embeddings uh, with the new data, with the, with the, with the new, new training data set. But we also want to try to train the model using a, a bilingual phrase embeddings. So instead to compare only the words in, a, with the, in this vectoral space, the, the software is able to compare sets, phrases, so short sentences all together. And um, the, the, the third step we, we have in mind now is also to improve uh, the performance of the tool, how checking uh, which change uh, the, the people, the translator have been made after they recheck the flag items. So if it's merely like they were looking at the uh, typos and cosmetics uh, or it's more like uh, rephrasing the sentence in, to, in order to improve the flu fluidity. So that's what I have so far. So if uh, I have the chance and it works, uh, I, I would also like to, um, to, to show you uh, how the, 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 the code performs. No? So uh, how it works in, a, in, a, in a, with a small uh, de de uh, demo. Let me try. So at this stage we have, um, Do you see the my screen or only the presentation? Um, only your presentation. I think you have to stop sharing and share it again for Zoom to. I do immediately. It. So be patient. Yeah. Of course, no worries. Mm, here, share. So in this uh, is video, this demo. You can see my the folder where I, I store all the all the initial material. Okay, it's too fast, so let me go back. So here we have um, a, a demo a data set uh, that I will show you in a bit. Then the Python code that is able to perform the exercise, and then the bilingual word embeddings uh, that I have been trained uh, previously. So as soon as uh, um, let me wait for my demo file here. Okay, it's coming. So here, what we observe is uh, we have the, the um, English version on the left, and then we have the, um, the translation on, on the right. This is like a CSV file that we need to feed to the, to the tool, okay? And uh, there are a couple of, uh, uh, um, so we have to use the quotation bracket when we have a comma in the text, so we have to pay we have to pay, to pay attention to also this one. And um, I want to now to, 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 to use it. So, uh, so I need to, so as I said before, these are the embeddings that we trained before. And uh, I use uh, my terminal. So the, the, the um, I, I will work with my terminal, so. Here I, I have to go to my folder and then I, I run this code and um, the, this is the code that I was um, using to, to run the exercise and uh, slowly, uh, unfortunately, uh, we get uh, the, the, the tool is, is uh, providing our as a feedback. So this is the generic, this is the translation and then provide the, the value 0 0.6. 
and uh, this is the uh, translation score I was mentioned before. And, um, and here we can see that it's going one by one and provide the results here. This is a small demo. Uh, a small demo is available online uh, uh, and uh, it's going to be available online soon. So now, um, our plan for the future is uh, to make this demo uh, not only available, but to improve the way we people can use it. So we plan to make it uh, um, via an app that people can also um, download, so upload their uh, CSV file with the parallel uh, uh, corpora, uh, the target version and the, and the source version. And then they get the result also in a, in, in a CSV file directly, where we when we report all these uh, translation score uh, uh, values that uh, the, the machine is able to provide to us. That uh, is going to be uh, our next step. Uh, so make it available, uh, uh, open access for the people who want to use it. Current is available uh, as a, online in a GitHub repository. Okay, so that's uh, that's it for today. Um, I need to share again my screen. Yeah, um, to stop sharing. Thank you, Yuri. Um, we have one question um, in the chat, and then I have a comment as well. So first, could you tell us if there are plans for other languages to be um, explored? By this tool, this is a question. So, the, the 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 initial idea is to make it a robust tool for the that. Uh, so we want to achieve a given a, a degree or level of performance of the current tool. So improving uh, the, the the training data uh, and uh, also the bilingual phrase embeddings. Once we find out to have like a so we are satisfied with the current performance of the of the machine, of the tool, we, we plan to mimic the same exercise for other few languages. And uh, the choice of the other languages, uh, so it's going to be French, the, 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 the next one in line, is also depends on the on the um, benefit we can get when we apply this tool in a, in a, in a, in, a, in, a, in a shared environment. Nevertheless, uh, the beauty of this tool uh, is that uh, allow people that uh, are uh, working with uh, a not very common language, where we don't, they cannot easily find parallel corpora uh, uh, online, uh, because we are using monolingual corpora. So as long as you are able to combine uh, the, the English corpora and another monolingual corpora in a, in a, in a not uh, common speaking la language, Mm. Then the, our tool is able to 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 help the translator to perform uh, the verification. So, other language, probably at the end of next year. Yes, thank you for this answer. I have a comment about the um, short uh, segments, so to say. Um, that is definitely an issue. So we've, uh, with, with um, some colleagues here from the language um, translation department at UPF, we've been working um, uh, to, to, for a paper called Linguistic Complexity of Sorry Items. And we were, it, we're not using uh, embedding models, but we're using some other sort of statistical technique and it's basically corpus linguistics. And we were really stopped several months uh, by this issue because the survey texts have their, so to say, own uh, language world, which are very small. And uh, these models work on the basis that texts are um, larger, especially from readability, uh, readability studies. So in the end, what we did, and maybe this will be helpful for you somehow, I, I don't know, in this technique, but we um, consulted dictionaries of abstractness and dictionaries of um, uh, lexical diversity and abstractness. And we gave the models thresholds specifically for the survey world. Uh, one example, for instance, is that in abstractness levels, you can have uh, very abstract terms in survey research in very short uh, segments, 
that if you were giving a larger context, they're not that abstract. So we adjust for that and then we could go ahead. So the models improved uh, definitely. And also lexical diversity, because it is said that the more diverse the uh, text is, the more complex it could be, but on there's, uh, until certain threshold. Sometimes here you have all words differently in very short texts. So that was also giving us like penalizing a lot uh, our model. So we found those dictionaries useful to, to correct for this. Maybe that, that was my comment. Maybe you find those useful as well. So thank you, thank you, Diana, for this feedback. We're gonna have a look into that uh, for when we retrain the model and see between uh, supervised and unsupervised uh, by uh, word embeddings. Uh, we we can make use of the dictionary to to guide a little bit uh, the, the the generation of the embeddings. I don't have any other question or comment, so I will. Um, now give the ground to our last presenter of today, Roxanne, please. Um, yeah, the floor is yours. I will yes. turn uh, off my screen and video. Thank you. Uh, so the presentation is going to be uh, divided in, in two parts. Uh, first, uh, uh, Livio De Luca is going to speak to introduce uh, the platform and, uh, and the way it works. Excellent. Welcome, Livio. Um, are you sharing your screen? Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, so good morning, everyone. I, just a few words of introduction about the IOLI platform. Um, um, this platform is for reality based 3D annotation uh, for the collaborative documentation of heritage artifacts. So, um, the starting points of the development of this platform is the specific context of the cultural heritage uh, science and studies, which are a complex ecosystem um, that includes um, several activities, such as the access, the study, the conservation, interpretation, and the management of heritage objects. Uh, which includes also several actors such as uh, scientists, practitioners, um, administrators, etc. And this uh, introduced uh, for the study of the data produced by this community, uh, the analysis of, it all, of several approaches coming from humanities and social science, but also from the experimental fundamental sciences, such as material science or computer science too. Um, this complex ecosystem um, uh, introduced a um, very strong heterogeneity. Um, you know, cultural heritage um, concerns several objects, materials, observation devices, methods of analysis, and how these actors involved to produce data formats and conventions of description very heterogeneous which has also for, for, for which concern the terminology, the operational protocols, etc. So the, um, the starting point of the uh, IOLI uh, project is that the heritage object, the physical one, can be the common denominator between all this data, information, knowledge produced by these actors. Um, it's based on an innovative approach um, we try to establish an informative continuum based on three essential features. First, a continuous 3D mapping and annotation process. So we try to establish a bridge between the real object, its perception and its digital representation by memorizing specialized annotations made by different actors. Um, then a morphology-based data structuring approach so we introduced a multi-layer description model for managing simultaneous structuring of geometric uh, representations and user descriptors. And then we try to implement this model within a flexible and scalable technologies, uh, which is a, a web service for gathering, processing, and sharing uh, this semantically enriched 3D data uh, within online and on-site uh, uses scenarios. So there are two main innovations within the development of this platform. The first, uh, 2D, 3D annotation process based on uh, projective propagation 
and transfers of semantic attributes between images and 3D representations. So for example, the region selected on one image by the user is uh, mapped with the uh, 3D representation of coming from this image and then is reprojected in all the images that represent the same special region. And this is in automatic way uh, by a remote uh, computing process. And the second innovation concerns the uh, data structuring approach, which is based on uh, the a flexible data model that allow to manage several heritage assets, actors, and annotation layers around so the same data structure. Um, this structure is able to manage a semantic layer, which includes all the user descriptors um, uh, added for describing shapes and also some complementary resources. But on the other side, uh, this model is allowed to manage also a morphological layer uh, that includes some computed descriptors um, such as the basic geometry, the roundness, normals, uh, ambient occlusions, and other properties um, uh, coming from the geometric and visual spheres. And finally, the spatial temporal layer that allows to um, 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 accurately uh, locate uh, within the space and the, temp the, 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 the time um, each acquisition uh, made by each uh, actor. From a technical point of view, the uh, platform is based uh, on this kind of architecture. So we have the client side composed by HTML5 and JavaScript um, interfaces, um, allowing the 2D and 3D um, interactive visualization, and the a web server and um, a, a set of um, processing containers. Uh, which includes several um, uh, automatic processing, image processing pipeline uh, concerning the image specialization, the generation of dense 3D pong clouds, and also the extraction of geometric and visual descriptors. Uh, so in this website, you can find some uh, demonstration video, but also um, the access to our beta testing program. And finally, uh, just a few words about the ongoing works within the framework of the shock project. So we are working on the migration to a no SQL database and improving our Docker in architecture. Uh, we recently uh, updated the platform uh, with some uh, features concerning the collaborative framework. Uh, by including a social network, network approach and several sharing options. We are working with uh, Isabel Cao on the, in the integration of um, some controlled vocabularies, so several scarce dictionaries, and a link to another software called OpenTSO, also developed at the CNRS. And finally, um, uh, Isabel is also involved in the uh, description of the collaborative documentation process carried out by uh, an IOE user within the standard uh, Cydox URL. And that's all I leave um, now. Roxanne um, explain the main features of the platform with some examples com coming from our recent projects. Thank you, Livio. Roxanne, can you share your screen? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So can yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Um, here. So uh, as Livio said, uh, I will be now uh, focusing on demonstrations of the IOD platform by showing a series of little uh, short videos to illustrate uh, how it works. So here uh, is the creation of a project for a pediment located in the Guimet Museum of Paris. So here you will have a first possibility to create a project by uploading a series of photographies. 
So here it's a little bit sped up, but then you can wait uh, for the project to be created and you can finally have access to a 3D point cloud of the model and every images that were used to uh, create the point cloud. So you can then create a series of groups and layers <clears throat> that you can name uh, the way that you prefer to uh, speak uh, about different topics of the object. And then you have the possibility to create the annotation for uh, the section that you're interested in. Here, uh, the goal was to uh, divide the objects in different, uh, different blocks. So you can see the way that we can uh, click by click uh, create an annotation quite freely. Uh, of course, you can uh, choose uh, different colors, different types of a uh, way to create this annotation to have uh, different objects underlined. Here, uh, for example, uh, I chose a series of colors uh, to really make appear uh, the, the way that the pediment was, um, <clears throat> was created. And of course, here the process is a little bit uh, sped up as well to see really how the operations uh, can be created. And this is the final result. So as you can see, every annotation is uh, reported on every photography uh, that it should appear in. So uh, the big advantage is that by uh, only creating the annotation on one picture, you will have the possibility to see it on every picture of the project and on the 3D cloud. So here uh, I was uh, then annotating uh, the, the different uh, features of the pediment, such as uh, the, the trees, but then also the, the different humans that were presented on the scene. So to do so, I could uh, every time uh, choose a name for every layer uh, that I wanted to create, uh, um, create another annotations, another uh, color. And finally, I then created uh, a group for the alterations that could be spotted on this pediment. So here, for example, it was uh, um, the annotations created to show the uh, chromatic alterations. And you can see on the right, uh, what is the description sheet annotation? Uh, in fact, you can add uh, user descriptors uh, to uh, precise uh, some aspects of the object. You can, uh, you can choose to uh, fill in a text about uh, whatever you want. Uh, for example, you can, you can uh, fill in a little description. You can say where it's located. Uh, you will see that in uh, videos after this. And here is, uh, for example, the visual visualization in the 3D point cloud. So you can uh, quite freely uh, change the settings to uh, make things appear in the way uh, that you like. Um, I will then show a series of uh, various projects uh, to show that uh, finally this platform can be used on quite small objects, but others, uh, but also on others that could be uh, quite larger. So you can, uh, for example, uh, use it on objects, but also on uh, architectural elements or even uh, possibly buildings. And here is the, the, same, uh, the same piece of work. So for example, we had little uh, people that could be annotated uh, on the top of the column, but we could also uh, really show the different uh, parts of the columns on the different photographies. And here, the same way on the point cloud, all of these different elements can then appear. Here is a project that it's interesting because it's a little bit different. Uh, here, the goal was mainly to explain uh, the way that this uh, calendar uh, was uh, built and all of the, the figures that appeared on it. So you see it was, uh, it was created by um, a series of circles and a series of uh, different uh, representations. So here the platform and the annotation was really used to uh, make more explicit uh, all of these aspects of the, the calendar.
And lastly, uh, here is a third project, uh, a little bit different because it is on a much bigger scale. Uh, in fact, here is uh, uh, an acquisition by drone on the historical site of Delos. So we have um, the possibility to also create scenes for uh, little pieces of lands or a landmark that can be uh, quite larger uh, as well. So here was another uh, challenge and interest for the platform. Uh, it was a way to search how we could put at use uh, the IOLI platform to uh, the case of Notre Dame de Paris and specifically after uh, the fire that occurred uh, last year. So here is the beginning of this work in uh, the early month of 2020. Uh, you can see that in the same way, uh, the first step was to create a project by uh, inserting uh, multiple photographies. And then uh, to have this point cloud that was quite large, uh, a few meters uh, generated, I could then, uh, you, as you saw, uh, quite quickly uh, adjust the settings to have a point cloud with uh, points a little bit uh, smaller to have the division that I wanted. And then uh, uh, the same way to create a series of groups uh, and layers to um, try to annotate all the different alterations and all of the different pieces of woods and metals that could still be seen on the top of the vaults of uh, the cathedral. So here is the beginning of this process. Uh, I was annotating here, uh, as you can see, uh, the pieces of uh, woods and then here uh, all of the pieces of metals. So one thing that is important to note about this work it is that it was uh, made a few months ago uh, in a time where we didn't have access to the diagnosis that was then uh, made by the architects in charge of the, the project. So uh, everything that is uh, in underlined here is really based on personal observations and not uh, the official diagnosis that was sent uh, since uh, released. So really, uh, you can keep that in mind. It's uh, more of a way to test the platform's ability to work on such objects uh, than here a faithful uh, reconstruction of the diagnosis. So as you can see on the background, I was continuing my work to annotate different uh, pieces uh, that could be identified on the, the top of the vaults. Uh, you can have different, uh, very different sizes uh, of objects to do so. And here is what I talked about a little bit earlier is the user descriptors. So here, for example, I chose to uh, talk about the intensity of the alteration, the type of alterations that we had, um, but also the location on the vaults uh, to be a little more specific and give more information about uh, uh, the alterations that were uh, annotated. So here you can see how the alterations can then spread uh, on every photography uh, and be uh, quite faithfully retranscripted. And here is the result on the 3D point cloud. So as you can see, uh, the names of the alterations uh, and the, all the annotations aren't filled in, but of course you can give uh, a name to every one of them and have them located precisely on the, the 3D point cloud. So this was also an opportunity to test the platforms uh, because here, for example, we have around uh, 300 different annotations. So working on such huge project was also a way to see how the platform could handle such big projects. And here you can see a final step, which is the creation of a heritage asset. Uh, this is some kind of identity card for the building or the object that you're working on. Uh, you can, for example, fill in a description. You can say where uh, the object is located. Uh, so you can really um, fill in a lot of uh, different knowledge around the object. 
And then the goal is to link these heritage assets to the project that uh, worked on it. So here, for example, you can see it appear on the front page, but it also allows when you click on an heritage asset to view a list of all of the projects that are linked to it and then uh, see them all together. So finally, this is a short video to see uh, what is a little bit more recent uh, in our work. Uh, so this is only a few uh, weeks back. Uh, the new goal uh, was now that we had access to the official diagnosis of the architects to uh, create the scenes uh, that referred to this diagnosis and to have an annotation that could the most faithfully possible uh, be a retranscription of the work that uh, they have done uh, on uh, photographies by themselves. So here we had uh, a will to name all the groups and layers the, the closely as possible as uh, their own titles. You can see on uh, the different photographies how uh, these annotations appear. And the final step, the final goal, uh, was to um, upload these scenes uh, located on uh, small parts of the cathedral into what we call the Notre Dame viewer, uh, which is um, a 3D space that allows us to see all the points cloud um, that refer to uh, the cathedral. So this process allows us to see every annotation that was made directly on uh, the whole cathedral. We can also, as you see, uh, visualize all the photographies that were used, uh, as well as the user descriptors that were uh, filled in. And here uh, you have the, the, the scene, uh, the, the point cloud of the, the Aioli project appear, and you can here see how it looks in the whole uh, point cloud of the cathedral. So this is the end of my presentation. I'm going to quit here. Um, I don't know if we had questions. Thank you, Roxanne. I think we don't have questions, but I have a couple for you, if I may. Um, what about contradicting annotations? That is, as far as we understood the tool, uh, different researchers are able to see others' annotations, right? So are you in a way, well, are you as a project like judging these annotations or would it work as a Wikipedia of annotations, so to say, and then uh, users should be the ones judging the certainty of them? Uh, yes, yeah, so I didn't uh, speak of that indeed. Uh, what we can do uh, right now on the platform is um, you have the possibility to have a project either uh, private so only uh, you can uh, you know, interact with it, only you can see it, or uh, to share it with other users. And uh, when you do so, uh, the, uh, the users will have the possibility to create their own groups and layers in the, into the project, but never to uh, erase uh, the work that you did. So uh, multiple people, and it was a goal too uh, on, uh, on the work with uh, Notre Dame. So uh, other users and many users can work on the same project, but uh, never, uh, never uh, erase what the others did uh, possibly before. Okay, thank uh, you very much. Please, Livio. Yeah. Uh, if we can add a comment on this. Um, we are not really interested in managing contradictory annotations because we just want to collect annotations coming from different levels then we we uh, and, and we are envisioning to start analyzing annotations mm -hmm. by basing on the notion of a spatial overlapping so um, we, we imagine to detect some um, um, uh, overlapping annotations, then to compare this annotation in terms of semantics related to the special region, okay? But we don't want to manage it as a process to be validated 
by someone, but just to be analyzed by others. Yeah, I understand it could be quite challenging if you uh, decide to take that route. I'm quite uncertain as well. I will just add a comment about the size of the database. I guess this grows quite fast and it's on the several terabytes, I would say easily. It will grow exponentially, right? Yeah, it's a, we, we are looking today to some distributed uh, solutions for managing uh, the big amount of uh, data and we cannot imagine to centralize all the projects uh, created by leaps um, and I think that also the spirit of this project is towards the a distributed um, strategy yeah okay so thank you so much to all my presenters I just have one last slide as a take-home message I will share now my screen. Let me check that I pick up the right one. Um, okay, concluding remarks. Oops, sorry, I asked. So the SHAP project chapter on innovations in data production aims at generating research outputs that support the production of fair data. You saw here three examples of them we have now. Um, we have more, sorry, but in this first uh, event, we wanted to showcase those that are a bit more advanced in the way um, of the shock. Um, this innovations in data production chapter aims to improving uh, users' experience. And by users' experience, we mean our research communities, sorry researchers, heritage scientists, and social scientists in general, um, their interaction with data. And this could be the example of the MCSQ or the IOLI platform, but also enhancing the production of collaborative data, as you saw just in the IOLI. Um, this chapter of the shock aims at developing open source and open access tools, creating economies of scale across research infrastructures, such as the automated translation verification tool that may be useful for other survey projects as well. And also improving the production of primary data, that is the survey data, for instance, or the heritage data by improving internal procedures. Um, as the example here, it would be the internal translation procedures, and that uh, is same by the automatic translation verification tool or all the MCSQ. And with this slide, I close this session. Um, I stop sharing my screen. And I thank you all for your attendance. And um, yeah, it's our time to, to say bye. Thank you, Irena, for organizing everything as well. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.